I have always loved chess since I was like nine years old. I have loved the game. And if I took it seriously, I'd probably be a grandmaster by now. I absolutely loved everything about it. I had literally even read the hist. I had several like really short uh, history of chess books, like several over the years. And like I read it, like literally started in ancient India, moved through like basically the whole Silk Road all the way into Europe. Then the the modern game descends from that. But like chess is not a joke, man. War generals play it till now. They played it back then and they play it till now. But the thing is, it's just a it's a representation of human beings of, of it's a. It is a socio-political representation of human beings in a fashion that anyone of any age, any race, any gender, anyone can play. Anyone can understand it, play it, and get good at it. It is a devastatingly... It's a brilliant game. You know, people say, oh yeah, we, we you know, you're all pawns or... <laughs> I've literally said, and oh yeah, you know, I, I'm the king on, I'm the king on this board, you know, or that you, he's the king on that board and you're all just pawns. Like, it's like the only pieces that people actually know are the king, the queen and the pawns. That's it. What does that tell you? Because there's five different types, six different types of pieces. There's the king, the queen, the bishop, the knight, the rook, or the castle, and then the pawn. But they only know three of them. And it's something I only came to realize, again, very recently. That, the, in fact, the game of chess has so many different combinations. No two games will ever be this if every single human being let's say if if every uh okay so let's say we have eight billion human beings right and every human being was playing another one right so that's four billion chess games those will be four billion chess games with the odds of every different move uh, played by every different person stacked onto it it's a game of literally infinite combinations, infinite. And it's in such a small setting, a board and 16 pieces on either side. And the, the combinations are near infinite. And the thing is, grandmasters, while yes, they can be born with that aptitude of, you know, being like really good at chess, really young. But the thing, these guys fucking read every day of their lives. They read books, they look up old games, they look up theory, they look up, you know, they, they record their own games. They like, <laughs> they literally have to study, they breathe, live and breathe it. And it's not a fucking joke the way they do it. It is, it, it is really an art form to watch two grandmasters play. And the thing that hit me the hardest is that people don't understand that game is, is <sighs> even as a beginner, you can move the king. I know it sounds as simple, but really just think about it. Is a chess game a chess game without the players? Right? Do the, the, do the pieces have any life in and of themselves? I'm going to guess no. But even a beginner can move kings. If you can do that as a beginner... And you don't realize that? Like, is that something you have to wait until you're a grandmaster to realize? One side controls the game, the other side controls the game. Simple enough. 
But think about the gravity. You, you, you know, you think about if you actually thought of the pieces on the board as actual people, you would probably either be really good at the game or really bad at the game. I've never done that. I might try that. But my the way I play it is very just in, instinctual. I'm not even sure if I enjoy the mid game or the end game or whatever, right? I just, I, no, no, no. I, I basically wait for them to make a mistake, right? I don't necessarily set traps. I wait for them to make a mistake. And my, I haven't, like, if I was able to expand my knowledge in the game, I'd be so good. So good. But that's on me anyways. Right. You can always be, you can literally always become good at chess at any point in your life. Any point. I, I love the game. It's so, you know, it's one of those things that it teaches you about the consequences of your choices in a fun way, right? But if it's a war general playing it, it's not fun because they're replicating the war that they're engaging in and they have to figure out if he moves here i have to make this move or else i'm gonna lose a thousand fucking soldiers right every pawn suddenly becomes a thousand soldiers but you as a beginner can move kings you can move the king you can move the queen. But the thing is, you can lose the queen and still win the game. You lose the king, you lose the game. It's a thought that I really haven't... I really haven't been able to explain it in the right way. Even as a beginner, even as a novice, even as a naive person, your actions have such dire consequences. But the thing is, you can affect people that you have no idea you could affect. This uh, projection of authority, I see a lot of people pushing onto one another, is one such example. Because your king, in a sense, is your opposition. Your own king is your opposition. You don't want that king to get in any compromising position, otherwise you lose. But again, the king is fucking useless because it can only move one, one square uh, on either side. Literally one square diagonally, one square back and f backward and forward. It can be an offensive piece, though can be a defensive piece as well, right? But at the same time, you don't want to be playing defense and offense with your king. It's a, it's a weird, it's, it's a concept, um, what the, who, who came up with it? It's a concept called power behind the throne. Some French, uh, woo woo bullshit kind of word but I can't remember it right now it's a concept of where true power comes from because I've said before that kings are selected and they're only uh, their reign is only contingent upon the nobility and the clergy both agreeing that yeah this is the guy because they could, they could conspire and overthrow you, right? A, a rival army could come in, kill you, uh, capture you, you know. <clears throat> a lot of things could happen. But ultimately, where is, the, where is his power projecting from, right? Who are the people you don't see influencing his decisions? Because I think a lot of queens, a lot of women, have also been behind a lot of the decisions that kings have made. In a, in, a, in, much remote, in a much more significant way than the king themselves, right? 
it, it doesn't have to be like a woman or a man behind it could be anything anyone or anything even just an idea <clears throat> even just the idea of someone even a dead person in a chess game you are the power behind the throne that's why war generals played it because they were the power behind the throne I even forgot the nobility, the clergy, and the military. And for a war general to play that game, <clears throat> either the king had to be oblivious of his, uh, uh, his power, or the king recognized his power, and either treated him as a threat or treated him as someone he can trust because he even he recognizes that there's a power behind him that most people cannot see and <clears throat> the type of world that we exist in right now is not it, it, it is the underworld. We are in the underworld right now. So all the strategy games and all the sort of, how do I put it? All the rules apply here. All the rules apply. Like so many movies will depict uh, a different world and different rules and different circumstances, but it's just a representation of our world. They've just found a way to uh, paint our world more artistically. The rules of Monopoly, the game Monopoly, apply in the real world because they were inspired from the real world. There's not a single game that's ever been created that doesn't apply its rules from the real world. It could be fucking... <laughs> How am I drawing a blanket games and I literally grew up playing them? Just think of whatever games you like to play, or video games especially, right? shooting lasers or superpowers or all that kind of shit it's a it's a representation of something right and you have to think that this this is a this is not even a game it this is it it is a game yes in fact it is a game right it's it is virtual reality we have existed in virtual reality since the formation of institutions themselves. Because think about what an institution does. I constantly say that they were created by psychopaths, and I stand by that. Most of them. They are created to replicate, like... They, they are created to replicate the kind of person who created them. Simple enough. An organization like the Vatican exists to create the kind of people who devised of the Vatican. The kind of bullshit you see that they're involved in right now is by design. I love watching... um. <clears throat> benedictine's the vegans uh videos he's he's so knowledgeable like he says the problems that we see in life are not they are not a problem they are not an anomaly of the system they are not a bug in the system they are a feature it's not a bug it's a feature and it's so damn true all of these problems and uh controversies and uh, uh, injustices, blah, 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 you name it, they are a feature of this system. Right? 
All of the things that we found abhorrent about ancient civilizations still exist to this day. They have re been rewarded, repurposed, pushed further into the shadows or pushed right in front of our faces and we just accept it all. We've been living in a virtual reality since the point where these the ideologues that came out of these institutions told us how exactly life is or what life is under the threat of death. It's not phones and Facebook that created a virtual reality, no. Because without all these social concepts, we're just organisms living, breathing, shitting, eating, right? F f reproducing organisms. And we somehow find a way to have social interactions that enable us to do more of that breathing and eating and shitting and pissing and fucking. In, in lieu of that, We have institutions, we have mythologies, and the, I like mythology, they're really fucking cool, no matter which ones they are, right? Mythology is cool, religion is fucked up, because they take mythology and then say, this is how it actually is, this is how we say it actually is, and if you don't believe it, you can get your fucking head chop chopped off, you can get crucified, you can get burnt at the stake. There's so much to learn from ancient mythologies and you can understand them. Like for you to come up with such abstract mythologies as well, we are still getting inspiration. Modern fucking media is just repurposing ancient, um, ancient mythology over and over and over and over and over again. So where does the power really lie in that sense? It lies in you recognizing that in this reality, all the rules apply. You just have to know which rules apply and when they apply and who they apply to. It's really Grand Theft Auto out here. What can I say? <laughs> you know, because people have cheat codes out here. People have hella fucking cheat codes out here. And it's one reason I love martial arts, especially like ground fighting. Uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu took off in like the last 40 years because it showed that a small person can do massive damage with the right amount of leverage against a big person. Very easily, <laughs> astoundingly easily. Our bones, no matter how small you are, are incredibly strong. There's no other power in this world except for leverage. None, 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 none. Leverage is the only power we truly have. And once you understand that, you understand that you can move kings in that sense? I honestly think there's nothing that can stand in your way. <laughs>